Let's all stand and turn to song number 110.
this morning, that song is very true. Now, regardless of where you are in life, it is sweeter as the years go by, as the days and the, and the weeks and the months. It's richer, and it's fuller, and it's deeper. Isn't that wonderful to have that experience in a sanctified life that we can have uh, an experience with God through the power of the Holy Spirit yes. yeah. that can grow with us all through life and be with us all the way to eternity. What a wonderful promise that we have. It's good to be here this morning. It's good to be fellowshipping with you, and it's good to see all of you. We certainly appreciate everyone that has come this morning, and maybe you've been here all weekend. I know the Columbia Camp County crowd appreciates you being here, and I do want to say we appreciate the Columbia crowd folks for hosting this event this weekend. It's so important to our fellowship and our church that we come together when we have an opportunity, uh, read the word of God and worship together, and uh, it's important, and we thank you for doing that. I'm just here to open the meeting, and we want to have some testimonies. Brother David Copeland's going to read for us this morning. I know we're all going to enjoy that. We want you to give him your attention, and then he's going to close the service. Um, my mind has been on a story uh, in the fourth chapter of Second Kings, and I've thought about it. Um, it takes faith to serve the Lord. The Bible says, he that cometh to God must first believe that he is, and that his, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So that's where we find ourselves. But there's a story in the fourth chapter of 2 Kings. It is a story of Elisha and a widow woman who was indebted to a creditor. Um, and the creditor was going to come and take her two sons and make them slaves, basically, in order to recapture the debt. And she didn't know what to do. <coughs> so she sent to Elisha, and he asked her, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? And you know, that's really what the word of God ask of us what can I do for you and the plan has been laid out in the word here that God can do all things for us if we'll only have the faith to believe and so a solution I thought about this a solution would have been to say okay the debt is canceled go your way you're you're good but he didn't do that. He asked her to do some things, to step out on faith and to do some things. And he said, how many vessels do you have in your house? He said, well, I got a pot of oil. He said, send your guys out, send your sons out, and collect all the vessels that you can, and not just a few. There was work to do to right. reach the solution. So the guys went out, gathered all these vessels. I don't know how big they were. They might have been, somebody said recently, they must have been pretty big. She came back and says, okay, we, we have this array of vessels. What, what are we going to do? He said, you have that oil. Just start pouring. And fill them up. And they did. And she said, okay. Now what are we going to do? He said, take that oil and sell it and pay those debts. So I thought about that. When we come to God, there is going to have to be a work on our part. That's right. yes. Serving God is not like putting on a, a coat or a garment or like showing up at certain times of the year or being a Sunday morning kind of person, but it is a 24-7 experience that takes faith on our part, 
but is also asking us to do. I think there is a verse that says the things you've heard, do them. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. Do, do them. So we might be asked to collect all the, we might, in our own spiritual life, let me just put it this way, in our own spiritual life, there is a work for us to do. It may not be always be obvious, but we may be asked to go and collect the vessels and take what we have, just a small amount of oil, and fill those vessels and take that and distribute it to do what God wants us to do. So I'm thankful that we have those examples on record for us to follow and that we can see how God dealt with people even in Old Testament times. Not just in New Testament times, but in Old Testament times. So I'm thankful for that this morning. You know, we, we have nothing else to lift up here today but Jesus and the Word of God. It's all we have. It's all we have. The Bible says we preach not ourselves. And we do not. We should not. We do not. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. So I'm thankful this morning that we can stand on this word of God. We can lift this up, and it can be our guide and our leader. Again, it's good to be here. We're glad all of you have come. We appreciate the Columbia County congregation hosting us this weekend. I know it's been a great time in the Lord, and we just look forward to more in the future. So if you have a testimony, step out and give it this morning. Brother David's going to come out when he feels led. And the Lord will lead us from there. Y'all pray for me.
Uh, JW texted me this morning. I'm going to uh, Evans. I've never been here before, but I'm here. Uh, she said, you want to go? I said, yeah, I think so. Text him back, I said, I'll be ready. So I text him back, I said, I'm ready early. If you want to leave, we'll go. All right, the main purpose we're here tonight, today, if you're lost, we have a Savior that can forgive you and give you something you never had before. Make you a brand new man every day. Wake up every day, you're a brand new man for Jesus Christ. So we don't preach to us, we preach Jesus. He's the one who's going to save your soul and take you home to heaven. In Shinkatig, it's a little different than it is here. I was there uh, at that feast meeting, and uh, I think I, I like to just try to pull a pass out of here. I like to get all, this is the first time I've been in Evans here. Forgive me for that, Jesus. You all too. So uh, I am uh, want to invite you to uh, something that can make you a brand new man every day. Yes. It's Jesus. Yes. Pray for me. Amen. Amen. I was out on the
thought as Brother Bobby got up and talked, um, uh, I was there in Shinktig this year, and uh, I believe that for you it was Church Street, right? Is that right? Church Street. Church Street. Well, for me, it was Bel Air Road, right here. Um, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is good to be here this weekend. Uh, I'm glad to say that I'm converted and sanctified. I don't, I don't want to say that and say it lightly. Right. Um, it is, uh, as mom and dad and I were talking this morning, uh, it is the constant, no, never changing influence in our lives. Yes. If you choose, you got to choose right. it, if you choose to serve the Lord. But it can be the one single constant in your life. Um, I, I thought a lot this weekend about um, home, <laughs> ironically enough, um, and uh, you know they say home is where the heart is, which is which is a good statement. Um, I have a home that I own that I live in, um, but I have a home here uh, that I spent a majority of my very formative years, and those that are here know that about me. Those that have lived in this crowd know that about me. Um, we moved here, I was 15. Uh, I am 51. A um, long time has passed since, since we've moved here, since mom and dad moved here. And, um, you know, I, th I thought last night I, I kind of, Tracy's not here, which puts me at a disadvantage. I just want to tell you all that. She is my better half. And when she's not here, I feel a little bit out of place. Um, so last night, things were getting rolling in the gym, and I just, I told Mom Dad, I said, I'm going to slide on home and just relax. And I got home, and, and I, I'm going to be quick, Brother David. I don't want to take much of your time. I, I, you know, I, both, both uh, yesterday morning and this morning, I got up a little earlier than Mom and Dad, and um, there's, a, we, there's a kitchen table there that has, that's been, it's a generational kitchen table, if I understand that correctly. It was owned by my grandparents, and it's been in our and with mom and dad since since, my, since the time I've been around right so um, so that kitchen table is kind of synonymous for me so my thought today is home what does home mean to you right what is so I got thinking about what being back at mom and dad's what does that mean to me what what there are certain sounds so so quietly when I sit in the house there's a certain clock that I've heard a lot of my life and I hear it I can when it's quiet in the house I can hear it tick there are certain, definitely certain smells that are associated with 
a child at home that you might have, right? Whether you're cooking or whatever, right? If you can imagine yourself being back in your childhood home. Uh, and I thought about other things that what does home mean? Um, safety is one thing that I thought about, right? If you, if you were a kid, if you ever remember a kid and you were playing tag, what, what, was, what was safe? Home base, right? Home base. You were safe. There was no, you couldn't be tagged when you were on home base. But when you, were, when, when you start to grow up and you, you, you start to fill out your own uh, independence, um, there is a certain knowledge that home is where some things still are. Uh, my my uh, adult children, as they're moving out, uh, they're experiencing some of that. You know, they want a good, they want to not spend money while they're going out to eat and they want to find some good food. Yeah. We get calls, hey, what are you guys doing for dinner tonight? <laughs> they understand that, right? And they know when they get home, mom's also got other things. We, we shared a little bit about that this weekend. They get an opportunity to come shop in, in the pantry at the house. So home means a lot, a lot of different things. But there, there are two passages of scripture that I thought of. One is, and I'm not going to turn down to it, I'm just, just going to speak to it, the first one. When the children of Israel were going to Jericho, they met a young lady there. And she, she harbored the, the, the gentlemen that were there visiting before they were going to conquer. Now, her lifestyle was probably not the best lifestyle. If you were to go back and read the scripture, uh, it talks about her lifestyle. But she helped God's people, and they gave her a promise. And if you go back and read that story, there's one verse in there. I'm not, I, I won't be able to quote it, but it speaks to the fact that when they left and they said, we're going to come back and destroy the city, but let me tell you that everyone that you know of that, uh, and talks about all their kindred, if they come back to this home, and it uses the passage, it uses the word home, they will be safe. And that's all it says. <clears throat> and when they came in, they destroyed that city, but those that were in that home were safe. That's one passage of scripture. Then I thought about this passage of scripture in the 15th chapter of Luke. And you may go, oh, okay, that's pretty familiar scripture. That's the prodigal son. Well, I'm not going to read the prodigal son part. Uh, I'm going to read the verses before that. The 15th chapter of Luke, the fourth verse, it says, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. That, that is a, a, an analogy to what Jesus Christ does for us. What God, when he's looking and finding us and where we are, we don't, God, I, 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 I've said this at home in Raleigh, I, I think we read this passage, sometimes I think, well, God kind of comes here and meets us at the altar. No, no, no. Understand that God is searching for us in the, in the beggarly places that we are. Uh, you may think that if you have lost children that, well, I don't know about the places that they are. Let me tell you, God understands those things, and he is there. And I believe that God is calling and was calling me in places where I should not have been. He was calling and reaching, and that is what the Spirit of God does. That, that call of God comes to you wherever you are. So um, he went out. It says that he went out to find that lost sheep, and then we found it, put it on his shoulders rejoicing. And this is the verse that struck me. And when he cometh home, where does he bring that sheep? I never noticed it until I read it this weekend. I thought maybe he put it back with the 99. Scripture says he brought that lost sheep home. It says he brought it home. And then what does he do? He calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have, I have found my sheep which was lost. And I want to tell you this morning that, you know, we just, I described home, uh, my, I described my child, uh, one of my childhood homes, um, and it, it means a lot to me. But the home that really this scripture is talking about is in the presence of God. That is the home that this scripture is talking about. And, and I know that there are, we have people that, that come in and out of the midst of our worship that, um, maybe don't understand, maybe haven't had the experiences that I have or about a home life. But I will tell you, no matter what you've experienced growing up, what your 
family situation was, home can be found. And I'm talking about home where it's security, familiarity, people that love you, comfort, spiritual food, being filled up, having a life that is may not to the outside world look successful, but to the eyes of God that is filled with spiritualness is successful. That is what home really means from a biblical perspective. So I want to tell you this morning, if you've, like the prodigal son, if you've decided that home really wasn't the place for me, and I think a lot of people feel like that home, home with God is not the place for them. But I will tell you um, that there is no better place to find yourself in, as Sister Jerry Ann talked about, in all of life's journey. Okay? And, and when I say journey, there are highs and there are lows. Understand that. Uh, we talk about this a lot in Raleigh, and we understand that it's just life. Right, Brother Steve? We talk about this. It, that's life, folks. We are, you're experiencing life. But there is one constant in your life that you can always have, and that is Jesus Christ. And I want to say this morning, if you don't know the Lord, I would recommend him. For my own personal experience, my recommendation for being able to lean on someone, have someone to nurture me and guide me. Um, we sang a song in Young Folks yesterday. I want no wills, no ways of my own, dear Lord. The verse says, but when I kneel in prayer, dear Lord, teach me what to say. Don't let me, make sure I get this right, don't let me ask for anything that would lead me astray, right? Don't let me drift away, dear Lord, but let me hold thy hand, for I want to meet my loved ones over in the promised land. And so the Lord and the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you through life's journey, always and forever. He is the constant in our lives, and if you're wet, lost, don't know your way, home is right here. Y'all pray for me.
sanctified today, and it's good to be here. And uh, like the ones that I spoke this morning, other than you, Uncle Bob, you don't have any memories of being here yet, I guess. Can't say that anymore, maybe, but um, I've got a lot of memories of being here, and I can't, I guess we come once a year, and I can't help but walk down memory lane a bit. But I was singing this morning, um, you know, I think about people and ones that are gone and ones that are still with us. And um, but I was singing this morning about a time when I was 16, 17, I think I was 18 years old, actually, that piece of meeting. And I was struggling with some things and uh, transitioning into, into college and trying to figure out a mate and those kind of things. And, and uh, I remember I had sprained my ankle. Um, I don't know what we were fooling around Saturday, you know, out in the field. And, um, <clears throat> and I was sitting down that night, and I think Diana sat with me. And um, I think she started the song, The Old Ship of Zion is a great man of war. And um, something about that song and that um, just recognition of, as you said, Brother Scott, just the, the constant that God is, that Jesus is, that the gospel is, that the Holy Spirit is in our life. It's never lost a battle. And it never will. Um, every battle that I've turned over to God, he's won. Um, every time. And... Um, Sister brought up at Shingatig, you know, a class that she was in and how, you know, the question was asked, ultimately, does good or evil prevail? And she was horrified to hear so many students say, well, evil, evil seems to prevail. And, and people don't know. <laughs> He's already prevailed. <laughs> good has already won. Jesus has already won the victory. Um, God is on the throne. He is in control. And... I think sometimes it's just our perspective and our eyesight, our physical eyesight that doesn't allow us to see uh, the victory that God has won. And I, I got a victory that night, 18 years old, and I find myself here some years later, and God has given me victory Amen. in life. I, I stand here to t I'll tell you guys, I have less confidence in myself, I think, than I ever have, and I have more confidence in God Amen. today than I ever have in my life. Um, I've heard that in your 40s you begin to become aware of all your failings or failures or maybe your kids just teach you about it I don't know but uh I tell you what God <clears throat> God comes through every time and I'll encourage you today I don't know what your life is like Monday through Saturday I don't you know know your situation or circumstance but I'd encourage every one of you um turn your problems over to God yes. if you're facing trouble at work or facing trouble with your children or facing just inside trouble you don't understand um, turn it to God go to him <clears throat> and I think oftentimes we think well I know what he'll say you don't you don't I don't we put God in a box way too often but God has an answer for you for every problem in life for every situation and it may not be what you think it is but I guarantee you God's solution works I guarantee you it does um, there's a lot of folks that, it's sad to me, a lot of folks seem to not want to turn to God because they think that if doing so, they'll maybe lose control. And doing so, maybe they'll face judgment that they don't really want to have to face. Um, a lot of people shun church for that reason. They feel people judge them harshly or um, maybe you're afraid of God judging you harshly if you come to God. Um, but I want to talk today about a phrase that's found in the Bible 23 times and referred to much more than that. Um, and it's the phrase, the day of the Lord. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, I don't, I'm not an expert by any means, but, um, but I've found being sanctified. Maybe you all have too. And if you're not familiar with this, I'll try to tell you about it. Um, before I got sanctified, I could read the Bible, but not really get much out of it. You know, I'd understand a little bit, maybe. Um, and I was amazed, even as a young boy, when I got sanctified, I began to read that I understood it. It impacted me. It, 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 did, it, it stuck with me. Um, it would, like, lodge in my brain, and I'd, you know, have it in my mind during the week. Um, and, and over the years being sanctified, this has become one of my best friends. I tell you, it's, um, it's become, I, I respect it more than I ever have. Um, this, is, this, this is Jesus, and this is his word. This is, this is something about the only tangible thing we have, physical thing, I should say, we have on earth that, that, is, that is heaven itself and it's, it's it's god's authority it's god's word it's god's right. truth right. all in this word of god and i encourage you to read it i encourage you to dive into it study it if 
you have a question, go to the Bible and try to find an answer for that question there. Um, if you're not sure about some doctrinal point, dive into the Bible and try to find it. Um, but I will tell you, if you're not sanctified, you're going to have a hard time understanding the Word of God. Um, and so I encourage you, too, to seek that. Seek His Holy Spirit. Seek Him to help you. Um, it will help you understand His Word. It will help you in life. And, and, uh, but I think most of y'all that are sanctified have experienced this. There's times when I read, and it's good. And then there's times where I read, and it feels like I am just outside of time and place. I'm sitting at Jesus' feet. Um, I can feel heaven. <laughs> and it's speaking to me in a way with, with words that I couldn't even, or thoughts that I couldn't even describe, maybe. Um, there's concepts that the, the Holy Spirit reveals to me that I couldn't have gotten through years of study. But because of the Holy Spirit speaking to me through his Bible, it helps me understand things that I wouldn't understand otherwise. And so I, I'm not an expert, I wouldn't say this morning, but I can share with you what God's revealed to me. And um, kind of leaning on something Uncle Harry used to say um, <clears throat> when he said, if I can feed the saints, I can feed the sinners too. And I feel like if we can just break open the word of God and share what God's given us, then it can bless everybody here. Um, so uh, if you just search, you know, I use the Olive Tree Bible app. I like it. Other people like other apps. That's fine. Uh, I'd encourage you to find one you like. But um, when I search for the phrase day of the Lord, again, there's 23 different, you know, scriptures that come up with that exact phrase. And I'll read a few of them to you because um, I wonder what you think the day of the Lord means. Um, <clears throat> In Jeremiah, it says, For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance. A day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. I'm going to read, my text today is going to be in Joel, the first couple of chapters in Joel, so we'll talk about it some there. In Amos, fifth chapter, he says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness. And not light, as if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him. Or he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, thinking he was safe, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the Lord of the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Okay. And Zephaniah says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. <clears throat> In Malachi, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. You know, the scripture before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so maybe that starts to give you some picture of the day of the Lord. It's a day of vengeance. It's a day of judgment. Um, and with that, I'll start reading the book of Joel. I was kind of wrestling this morning with the Lord a little bit. Like, I don't want to read the entire first chapter of Joel, but I think we're going to read the f entire first chapter of Joel. So y'all, if you have your Bible out, read along with me, and uh, we'll discuss it a little bit. We're, I think we're going to have Sunday school this morning, if that's fine with y'all. So. <clears throat> chapter 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it. And let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. So this is a time where all the crops, all the good things, all the food for the, for the, all, you know, for the harvest has been eaten up. There's nothing left. There's no, there's no sustenance left. It's a bad time. Awake ye drunkards, and weep and howl all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land. Here's a different picture. Strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Again, talking about that complete ransacking of the good things of the land. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. 
The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how will ye vine dressers for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, how ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. The whole thing is collapsed here. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, of thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And I'll come back to the second chapter of Joel in a little bit, but I want to turn to Luke chapter 12 and read you some of Jesus' words that I think tie into this. <clears throat> this is echoing what the brother preached on last night about the uh, Sermon on the Mount in Luke. It records it very similarly. And he says in the 31st verse of the 12th chapter of Luke, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupted. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Be like this, Jesus is saying. I think we should listen to this. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when you think not. And Peter said unto him, Lord, speaketh thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, right. and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him as portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Yeah. <clears throat> and he goes on to talk about fire that he came to send on the earth and it echoes this again in first thessalonians i don't know that i'll well let's read it i'd much rather y'all hear this than to hear me anyhow <clears throat> the fifth chapter of first thessalonians it says but at the times and the seasons brethren you have no need that are right unto you for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh as a thief in the night for when they shall say peace safety then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, <clears throat> that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. 
Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. <clears throat> the rest of that chapter is beautiful for every one of us. Right. <clears throat> the Old Testament, that day of the Lord was, was well, I say it this way. <clears throat> Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And I think <laughs> in that one statement, Jesus was claiming, <clears throat> just like the resurrection, claiming I am the day of the Lord. You know, side note, a lot of people ask the wrong question when they're talking about the resurrection. They want to know where is the resurrection. That's the wrong question to ask. Right, yeah. They want to know right. when is the resurrection. Right. Or when will it be? When was it? When did it happen? They addressed that in 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. There was confusion. Right. It's the wrong question. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> People want to know <clears throat> what is the resurrection? Right, yeah. What does it look like? What it, there's books written about what people suppose some yeah. future resurrection. It's all wrong. Right. It's the wrong question. The correct question to ask is who, who is, is the resurrection? Yes. Yes. The only definition we have in the scriptures is when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That answers all of it. Jesus is the resurrection. There's something inside of us that knows that we are dead inside and we need to be raised back to life. You, I just believe that every soul knows that inherently. And the devil would confuse us with looking at this or looking at that. Look at, but what you need is Jesus Christ. And it's not some future thing. It's not something you missed because you didn't live. But it's something you can have right now is to have the resurrection. And the day of the Lord is similar. The day of the Lord really is Jesus Christ. It was his day. There was, uh, there's a scripture in Revelation that um, is, is interesting to me. I, again, I get little glimpses, I feel like, and I understand this and that. And there's a scripture that talks about how time ceased. <clears throat> there was kind of a clock ticking from the time that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. There was a, there was like a stopwatch, you know, alarm clock, if you will. <clears throat> there was something coming that all of heaven and earth was anticipating. And when Jesus came <laughs> and the angels filled the sky <clears throat> and they proclaimed to the shepherds about how Christ has come. <laughs> it's the hope of mankind. It is the resurrection. It is the redeemer. It is the savior of the world. John the Baptist through Revelation saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus began his ministry. And you all know three years he taught, he could speak to you and know exactly what you were feeling, what you were thinking, your sin, your past, your condition. He extended mercy. <clears throat> he taught last night about that woman that was taken in the very act of adultery. And all these men standing around ready to execute what the law said to do. And Jesus just stooped down and began to draw on the dirt and said, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And they all began to walk away because they felt convicted of the sin that was in their own heart. That's what Jesus came for. And he turned to that woman. He said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? And she said, There are none, Lord. He said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This is what he came to bring. And y'all know there's a... <clears throat> I'll continue that thought in a second. Um, Brother Max talked yesterday morning about his granddaddy Chuck. And I remember him. Um, I've got some, some uh, Uncle Chuck stories. Daniel, me and you one time, I think we were 13 years old or so, <clears throat> and we ended up riding the old trap with your Uncle Chuck. The first time I'd spent much time with him. And he began to tell a story about a vision he had. And he was a man that had dreams and visions. And I'm sure you all remember him talking about after he got sanctified, the grass was greener, the sky was bluer. <laughs> he would dream about hearing angels, you know. He would wake up in the night and feel like there was angels around him singing to him. And um, you all might have thought he was crazy. I didn't. Um, I really believe the man saw those things. Um, but he told us about, I don't remember this or not, but it impacted me. <laughs> He had had a dream recently on the way to Old Trap. He was telling us <clears throat> that he had seen a, a, a great field. And from a distance, it was, it, was, it was a red field, and he couldn't understand what it was. And as he got closer, he realized it was, it was a field of blood and of bones and bodies. Really just gruesome scene. He went in a lot more detail than I will um, describing this dream. And I'll tell you, it freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> Sitting in the back seat of his little hatchback car we were riding the old trap in um, but just this week that came back to my mind as I was reading there in Joel yeah. and uh, he finished telling us that by saying that it haunted him to think 
that that's what sinners were headed for. Yeah, right. That was the fate of, of the sinner. <clears throat> it's destruction. Yes. Yeah. It is. It's destruction. Right. <clears throat> and so folks might think, I don't want to face Jesus. I don't want to go to an altar. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be treated harshly. I don't want to, you know, lose control of there's things in my life that I don't want to let go of. You might have those thoughts, but I'm telling you, if you are afraid of those things, <laughs> you don't need to continue just like you're going because you're headed for that very thing. <clears throat> Lord's judgment is waiting on, on everybody. It's waiting on everybody. There's a scripture that said, y'all can help me, Brother Rosh quotes it um, a good bit at home. Um, what does it say? Because sentence for an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, it is set in the hearts of men. Fully set. Y'all just say it. <clears throat> because it's not executed speedily, it is fully set in the hearts of men to do evil. Um, something like that. Yeah, it's in there. <laughs> the, uh, and I'll tell you, I think I really think that's part of our human condition. You know, if uh, Uncle Paul apparently used to say, if every time someone smoked a cigarette, their head blew off, you know, nobody would be smoking a cigarette. <laughs> well, that's kind of a cute thing to say, but it's true. You know, if for the things that you did wrong, for every lie we told, for every dishonest thing you did, for something you stole, something you cheated on, you know, somebody you treated really badly <laughs> you know if we were punished immediately for those things it changed how people acted yes, <clears throat> and so why isn't it done that way right. well that's a good question I'm not sure I completely understand it but I know God's designed it that way <clears throat> and I'm starting to see a little bit in life how it really is his mercy right. it's his mercy right. <laughs> if I had been executed for the sins that I had done None of us would be here, right, obviously, yeah, you know. Right. But God gives us a lifetime. Right. However long that is, to figure this thing out. Right. Our old folks used to say that this is a dressing room for eternity. You right. know, kind of like if you were you know, going out on stage and you were getting ready. Well, you know, there's a stage waiting on you. Right. Stage waiting on me. The Bible says that there is, it is appointed unto man once to die. Right. Right. And after that, the judgment. Right. <clears throat> And Jesus talked about a, a great white throne judgment that I believe was, you know, the judge, everyone that had died before his resurrection. Right. And everyone's gathered before him and then everyone was judged according to the deeds done in their body. Right. And it's going to be the same for us one day. Yeah. One day, I'm going to be standing without any of you guys, yeah. without my wife, without my dad to vouch for me, without anybody to give yeah. just me and Jesus. And the good and the bad is he knows. Yeah, right. He knows. He knows. He knows everything I chose, yeah. everything I did, and he knows why I did it. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and I had the thought recently, brought me to tears, it did, to be the man that's standing there in front of God, to be the man that had gotten really good at telling God no, had gotten really good at sitting in service, and feeling that prick on my conscience and brushing it aside. So I felt the call of God to maybe have heard him call my name and to walk out the door and be glad when that feeling was over. I can't imagine being that man standing in front of Christ and thinking of all the times I denied him. <laughs> God help. Because judgment is coming. And when he describes it like a famine... You know, and you can't escape it. That's right. He described it like a thief in the night. Well, why do they come at night? Well, it comes when you don't expect it. That's the problem with death. You know, we don't really kind of, we don't know. We really don't know when it's coming. I um, heard about a celebrity that died just, you know, the last few days, shockingly, out of nowhere. Well, one day you're going to be like, what, David? He's gone? You know, that's it. It's coming for all of us. We don't know when it is. And so I'm telling you, for you that aren't sanctified, the day of the Lord is the day of judgment when you die and you haven't committed your life to Christ and you're standing there with no excuse and he judges you because of what you've done, because of you rejecting him, 
You knew the gift of Christ on the cross, and you said, that's not for me. You said, that's not for me. When he said, I will be your Lord, I will help you, I will guide you, I will give you, provide for you everything you need, and you said, no, I've got this. I know what I want in life, and I'm going to go get it myself. <clears throat> when you stand before God like that, it's going to be on you like famine, like a thief. He describes in the second chapter of Joel that I'm going to read part of here, it is an army that you can't stop. There's, it is a fire that devours everything. You can't, you will not stand in the day of judgment against God. You will be judged. And there is a, it, some places calls it hell. Revelation calls it a lake of fire. <clears throat> it's a place of judgment that he's prepared for people that have rejected him. That's coming. Um, the day of the Lord is a little different when you're a sanctified person. And this is where I might need y'all's help a little bit. <laughs> because there's a lot of things in the Bible that are, it's not like this or that. It's like both hands, you know. Um, the day of the Lord is a future day of judgment. <clears throat> but also, <clears throat> we can hasten the day of the Lord, in a sense, by inviting him to judge us now. <clears throat> it's one of those things, my daughter last night was wanting to go spend the night with some of the girls, and she was a little... I don't know, let me tell them this, but we've all been there. Made a little nervous, a little hesitant, you know, about going. And I, I found myself telling her, I said, well, there's things sometimes we're a little afraid to do. But I often think, okay, if I don't do that, well, I'll be disappointed in myself later. Right. And that's usually enough to get me to get over the fear and do it anyways, you know, get a little right. courage. And it's the same thing with the day of the Lord. Guys, <clears throat> you can put off judgment and put it off and put it off, or... You have the option of seeking God, letting him judge you, even if it's harsh, even if he strips a lot of you away. <clears throat> Knowing that, what is on the other side of that is better, is what you need, is preparing you for a future, is making you the man and the woman that you need to be in this life to help other people, <clears throat> to be the kind of mother and father that you need to be, to be the kind of friend that you need to be. And forgetting all that, so you can look in the mirror... <laughs> And not be ashamed of yourself. Right. You know? <clears throat> yes, it takes courage to seek God. Yes, it takes humility to come down publicly to an altar and seek God. Is it worth it? Yeah. Yes, it's worth it. Um, <clears throat> there's a reason we talk about taking up the cross of Christ. You know, are you willing to take on his... Because going to the altar is not fun. It's not something people look to... You have to die there. That's right. You go there so your life ends so you can take on the new life that Christ has for you. But I'm telling you guys, there is, <clears throat> as was mentioned yesterday, there's a load lifted when sins yes, are forgiven. Sure. That is like nothing else. I remember how it felt to get my sins forgiven. But I also remember the conviction I felt beforehand. That was no fun. Um, but I tell you what, I don't know. I look around. I don't think you're all a bunch of wimps. You know, I don't think that's the case. But I wonder sometimes what it is that keeps you from making a start for God. Right. What is it? What are you afraid of? What is it? I don't know. But I, I don't want to leave you without the warning of how horrible <laughs> the future can be for you if you don't yeah. seek yeah. his judgment. I thought about that vision that, <clears throat> that Uncle Chuck had and shared with us that day. It is that bad. It was waiting on us if we're a sinner. But I was thinking about there's something about, you know, Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote that song about the uh, it is finished and talk about the, the line that's been drawn through the ages and I couldn't help but think about you know a battlefield um, there was a war <clears throat> you all know the Civil War nothing you all haven't heard of but July 21st I think it was 1861 was the Battle of Bull Run or the Battle of Manassas as the Confederacy called it and 35,000 Union troops 32,000 Confederate troops all gathered together in their fresh new uniforms and you know, muskets and cannons and, you know, ready to go to battle. And there was a third party there that day. There's a whole group of people that came out of Washington, D.C., which is about 30 miles north and from the other towns around. And there's pictures, photographs of these people and their nice outfits and the women in their, like, you know, white dresses and straw hats and men in their big mustaches and, you know, bow ties and, um, you know, all dandied up out there, having a picnic, kids, toddlers running around, all to watch the, you know, all to watch the war, all to watch the sight. We're going to watch this battle. It's going to be fun. You know, we're going to whip these, you know, southern boys and send them home, and it's all going to be over. Lincoln only conscripted his army for 60 days. 
They thought it was going to be over quickly. <clears throat> well, they found out very quickly yeah. what war really was. Yeah. It wasn't something to just to watch. It wasn't a spectacle. It wasn't even interesting. It was horror yeah. from the outset. It was. The Union, it is. The Union Army was, was winning, advancing, and uh, Confederate troops rallied themselves and led a charge, and it was just bloody. It was, man, I forget, it was like 70% of the men that day were casualties, um, 500, 600 dead. But the, the really just horrifying part to me was as they turned and they led that charge and the Union turned and began to flee, all the spectators were caught right in the middle of the battle. They were getting run over by you know, horses and wagons and getting trampled on. <clears throat> There's picture, other pictures from that day of the after effect of that battle. There's women looking for their children. Men looking for their wives. Didn't know where they went. Caught up in the war. <clears throat> there were no more spectators after that day. <clears throat> a four-year battle cost about a recent estimation 750,000 men and women died in that war. <clears throat> Something they went to watch that day. It was interesting to them. And I can't help but think of some of you that come to our meetings. What is it that holds you back? I worry sometimes that you think that you can just be a spectator. That you can be, that there is a sideline. There is not a sideline of this thing. We are all caught up in this. We are all caught up in the spiritual battle of life and death. Every one of us. There is no escape from it. If there's anyone that might be exempt, it's those that haven't reached an age of accountability. Well, and we ought to protect those children. <laughs> we ought to protect those children and keep them safe and teach them the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But I thought about that battlefield and thought about Uncle Chuck's vision and thought about this here in the first and second chapter of Joel. But somewhere on that field, a cross was raised. <laughs> somewhere on that field, Jesus appeared <clears throat> and became a sacrifice for us. We were imperfect. There was no but one of us that could give the perfect sacrifice for God. But Jesus... Do you know Jesus was the only man that from birth to death lived a sinless life? The only one that ever did that. And in doing so, he was able to represent me and you and all mankind and give the sacrifice that was needed so God could not just continually hold us away from him but could actually embrace us and take us in and make us his own. We owe everything to Jesus Christ. We owe everything to him today. I think I told you to read the. I don't think I'm going to read the, all of the second chapter of Joel. Time's getting away from us, and I'm expecting folks to want to pray this morning. <clears throat> but I will read this little bit here. Um, I would love to give y'all homework if you do it to go read the second chapter, whole, the whole second chapter. The Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for He is strong that executeth His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very ter terrible. Yeah. And who can abide it if you think you can go against God and make it? You're wrong. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye. Turn ye to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? And leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering, unto the Lord your God. I'll tell you all just from a, from a doctrinal standpoint, reading the scripture, <clears throat> and a personal standpoint. <clears throat> when you seek out God and you seek his forgiveness, you allow yourself to be judged at an altar. And then you come back and you offer God your life. And it was my experience, and I've heard a lot of your testimonies too, that God worked with you at that altar. He worked with me at that altar. Um, there were corners, little things that I was holding back. I didn't even know it. Um, and God began to root those things out and point those things out. And when I finally yielded everything to him, he sent his Holy Spirit and sanctified me. That's when the blessing came. <clears throat> but we got to pass through that. We have to do that. But after that is when Joel has that beautiful section that says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And if you're safe, seeking to be sanctified this morning, brother, this is what is waiting for you when you give God everything and you ask him, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, 
Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And Acts it says saved when Peter is recounting it. Here it says shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I don't mean to take any more of your time, but I want to know you to know I love you today. I love you. I wish that I could take the time to every one of you to sit down and say, how are you doing? What's new in your life? What's going on? What are you struggling with? What are you troubled with? How can I help you? you know? That's really how I feel this morning. Um, and if you're lost today or if you're struggling, if you're doubting, I want to help you. We all do. How can we help each other make it to heaven? How can we help each other? But guys, I tell you, if God has talked to you this weekend, if you've heard his voice, if you've felt his spirit, tugging at your heart, don't turn that away. Respond to the call of God. So as we stand to sing a closing song, if you would, come forward for, for prayer. It's been...
step into it, he will provide. Okay. Money is nothing with God. He, we got some in our pockets, but it ain't ours. Right. Right. The scripture says it's all his. Right. He says the gold is mine right. and the silver is mine. That's right. He said, don't tell the guys to resell that temple. Don't worry about the money. Yeah. I got a guy that's been kept with you in captivity for years that's going to give you his checkbook. With signed checks, yeah. go build it. Yeah. Right. Hey, go build it. The time is right. The time is right. Yeah. Just show me.